Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, I will be continuing my reactions to Epic History TV's Napoleonic Wars series. And the video we're reacting to today is Napoleon's Great Blunder, Spain, 1808. So, Epic History TV hinted at this at the end of the last video that we were going to get to, you know... Napoleon's Great Blunder, uh, an initial action, you know, bringing Portugal into the continental system, which seemed to go well, but ended up causing him a lot of trouble. So yeah, guys, please check out the Patreon, I'd really appreciate it if you did, there are exclusive reactions there, and let's jump right into this one. An Epic History TV, History March collaboration, supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In the autumn of 1807, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte dominated Europe. He had humbled Austria and Prussia, mm. and sealed an alliance with Russia. It's like, you know, he's defeated all the great powers of Europe, excluding uh, Britain, of course, but they're not on the continent. They can do all they want in the seas, but Napoleon is the master of the European continent. It must seem like... What could stop him, you know? Especially on the continent. There's nothing that could stop him on the continent. What could even cause him trouble? You know, all his enemies have been defeated. Well, uh, we're about to see what causes him some serious trouble uh, in the coming years. Of the major powers, only Britain still defied him. Safe from invasion, thanks to its powerful navy. Yeah. Napoleon had ordered all territory controlled by France or its allies to stop trading with Britain. The so-called continental system, or blockade, mm. designed to wreck Britain's economy and force its government to make peace. But neutral Portugal had continued to trade with its historic ally, Britain. Yep, long time So Napoleon partners. sent an army under General Junot to occupy the country and force it into line. The invasion was supported by France's ally, Spain. Though privately, Napoleon held Spain's rulers in contempt. The Bourbon royal family was decadent and corrupt. Mm. The king and crown prince loathed each other. While the country was effectively run by Chief Minister Manuel Godoy, the queen's lover. Mm. Spain, Napoleon concluded, was backwards, militarily weak, and incompetently governed. Uh, yeah, I mean, it basically was. And I mentioned this in the last video as well. At this point, you know, Spain and Portugal, they're far past their prime, basically. They're corrupt, they're backwards, they're struggling, they're not nearly as economic well-off as they once were. And pretty much most of the wealth they have and are producing comes from their colonies. Um... You know, Brazil for Portugal, and Spanish America for Spain. Their colonies produced vast amounts of wealth. Um, it's At this point, it's basically the colonies supporting the metropole, um, which, you know, partially explains why the uh, Latin American colonies will soon go for independence, because they're tired of supporting their old, corrupt, struggling mother countries. Um, but yeah, you know, Spain and Portugal are far past their prime. And he devised a plan to seize control of the country. Mm. In the spring of 1808, under the pretext of guarding Spain against the British, French troops took up strategic positions around the country. The Spanish people saw the French military presence as the latest in a long line of humiliations and yep. held Chief Minister Manuel Godoy responsible. There were riots at the palace of Aranjuez. Godoy was nearly lynched. Napoleon invited the Spanish royal family and Godoy to take refuge in the French city of Bayonne and sent Marshal Murat and 50,000 troops to restore order in Madrid. Yeah, you know, maybe uh, the French royals weren't willing to stand up for their country, but the people were. Um, 
Because, I mean, at this point, you know, there, there's there been little resistance to Napoleon from the upper echelons. But now the lower echelons of society, you know, the masses, the, the people, will start to actually uh, revolt and take action. But on the 2nd of May 1808, the people of Madrid rose up against Murat's soldiers. It became known as the Dos de Mayo Uprising, immortalized by the artist Francisco Goya. Mm. This scene shows Mamelukes of Napoleon's Imperial Guard attacked by the citizens of Madrid. Yeah, yeah, Goya had a lot of great art around this time period. You know, he was a Spanish artist, um, a very dark uh, artist. You know, a lot of his paintings were very <laughs> dark in tone. Um, I really like his work. I'd recommend you guys check out more Francisco Goya. But yeah, he documented, um, you know, this war well and showed uh, the horrors of the war as he was uh, prone to do in his work. A hundred soldiers were killed. The French responded ruthlessly shooting down dozens in the streets yeah and executing more than a hundred by firing squad and that's a very famous painting um which is usually shown when we talk about uh, these events um just sort of showing like i i mentioned the brutality of the conflict meanwhile in bayonne napoleon forced king carlos to abdicate and bestowed the title King of Spain on his own brother, Joseph. Mm. <laughs> that summer, as Napoleon forced a new modernizing constitution on Spain, and his brother Joseph entered Madrid as its new king, the Spanish reacted with fury. The French weren't just arrogant foreigners trampling on their national honour. They were godless atheists, who during the French Revolution had rejected the Pope and Catholic Church. Oh yeah. So you've got to remember that at this point, Spain is still super religious. They're still very Catholic. Um, Spain has not modernized in the same way that a lot of Europe has. Um, in many ways, economically and ideologically. You know, a lot of Europe has sort of begun the path towards secularism at this point. Spain, I mean, had, to a certain extent had. I mean, there was in, enlightenment in Spain. There, there were secular figures, but Spain is still very Catholic. And of course, the French Revolution, um, which Napoleon still claims to stand for to a certain extent, was very anti-Catholic and very secular. Um, so, you know, I mean, Napoleon's trying to implement sort of modern liberal ideas, a well-run government, a constitution, etc., etc. Um, but, you know, the people of Spain are really not into that, and they're especially not into the anti-religious nature of France, a lot of, uh, you know, the French Revolution, uh, Napoleon, as far as they see it. Um, not to mention that, I mean, even, you know, even countries that already were more liberal and enlightened still, you know, resisted the French because this is sort of foreign occupation. You know, like the French came into uh, Switzerland and Switzerland to a certain extent, already had a, dem a democratic system. You know, some cantons were more democratic than others. Some were more oligarchic. But they had some of the, you know, oldest running democracies in Europe. And the French came in, uh, and this is during the revolution, and they said, yeah, you know, we're for democracy and republics and all that, but we're going to do it our way. So regardless of how enlightened or liberal or democratic your country already was, the French wanted to come in and do it their way, you know, do things as they had done it, which caused a lot of resistance, even in more enlightened countries. And Spain at this point is certainly not an enlightened country. It's very religious. So you've got the foreign occupation combined with uh, the anti-religious nature of the French Revolution 
And, you know, the Spanish people, of course, are not going to like this at all. Napoleon, priests warned the peasants, was the very Antichrist himself. Yeah. Revolts erupted across the country. The Spanish army was joined by militias and partisans who attacked French troops and killed collaborators. French soldiers carried out savage reprisals. No mercy was shown. The countless atrocities horrified Francisco Goya and led to his famous Disasters of War series. Yeah. At first, it seemed the French would easily put down the revolt. Girona, Valencia, and Zaragoza were besieged by French troops, while the Spanish army of Galicia was routed by Marshal Bessières at the Battle of Medina del Rio Seco. But eight days later, as General Dupont and three French divisions withdrew from Cordoba, slowed down by wagons piled high with loot, they were surrounded at Bailen by General Castaño's army of Andalusia and forced to surrender. Mm. The Spanish took 18,000 French prisoners, about half of whom later died of starvation. Bailen was a humiliation for France, her first major defeat since Napoleon became emperor. France's enemies across Europe were delighted. Napoleon was incandescent with fury. I'm sure. <laughs> the situation went from bad to worse. The Portuguese... You know, you'd be pretty pissed off too if you're a Napoleon. You're like, I've beaten the might of Austria, Prussia, Russia. How am I having trouble with this? The, you know, this is embarrassing. You, you'd you be pretty angry. And of course, this leads to a lot of um, revolutionary and autonomous activity in the colonies. Because at this point, you know, if you're in the Spanish colonies, it's not like there's a whole lot of clear leadership coming from Spain. I mean, at first, your country is taken over um, by the French, and now there's basically an uprising. So the, a lot of revolutionary activity starts to foment in the colonies, um, which will continue for a while before they actually get independence. He's joined the revolt, while fierce Spanish resistance forced the French to abandon the sieges of Valencia, Girona, and Zaragoza. You also get that the Spanish pronunciation, Valencia, with sort of the lisp. Um, you know, in most of Latin America, they don't pronounce it like that. That's a uniquely Spanish pronunciation. Um, you know, in the Americas, we would just say Valencia. Um, so, yeah, that's you know, just an interesting little tidbit about, you know, pronunciation particular to Spain, but not the rest of the Spanish-speaking world. Spain's new king. Joseph Bonaparte was even forced to flee the capital. Mm. The British assisted the revolt, which the Spanish now called a war of independence, by yep. shipping weapons to Spain using the Royal Navy. On the 1st of August, a small British army commanded by Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Portugal to aid their revolt. On the 17th of August, he beat a small French force at Rolissa. Then, four days later, beat Junot's main army at the Battle of Vimero. Wow. But Wellesley's newly arrived superior, Sir Hugh Dalrymple, then agreed to repatriate Junot and his army to France with all their arms and plunder using British ships. In Britain, the generous terms were seen as a disgrace and scandal. Yeah, wow. A subsequent inquiry exonerated Wellesley, the future Duke of Wellington, but Dalrymple never held command again. I wonder why you would do that. I, I, I'm honestly not sure. It seems a little shady, but that, that would seem to be a, a big mistake. Um. Hmm. Can't be everywhere at once. That's probably not Napoleon's feeling. Napoleon decided the only way to sort out the situation in Spain was to go there himself. Mm. He assembled 130,000 reinforcements, including many of his best troops, and on the 7th of November, led a second invasion of Spain. 
most Spanish troops were inexperienced, were often badly equipped and led, and their armies had no coherent strategy. Yep. They were no match for the Grande Armée, which burst across the Ebro River and inflicted heavy defeats on the Spanish at Borgos and Tudela. At Tudela, Marshal Land's Third Corps avenged the defeat at Bailin by smashing the army of General Castaños, sending it fleeing in two directions. Napoleon pushed on rapidly. North of Madrid, 8,000 Spanish held the mountain pass at Somosierra. Napoleon, impatient to break through to the capital, ordered forward the Polish Light Horse of the Guard. In an attack of almost suicidal bravery, they charged the Spanish guns head-on and enabled the French to take the pass. Four days later, after Napoleon threatened to obliterate the city, Madrid opened its gates to his army. Unaware of the disaster engulfing Spanish forces, the 20,000-strong British army, commanded by Sir John Moore, had just arrived in Salamanca mm. after a 300-mile march from Lisbon, with another smaller force en route from Coruña. The British army was inexperienced, but in contrast to most Spanish forces, it was well trained, organized, and led. Yeah. As news reached more of the Spanish collapse, he nevertheless planned to divert French forces by attacking Marshal Soult's isolated Second Corps and threatening Napoleon's communications to Burgos and France. At Sargun on the 21st of December, the British 15th Hussars advanced overnight through winter frost and made a dawn attack on a French cavalry brigade, routing it in one great charge. Wow. But as Moore prepared a full-scale attack on Soult's corps, he received news that Napoleon was advancing rapidly towards him with his uh -oh. main army from Madrid. You're in trouble now. <laughs> Sword to their kidneys. Oh, man. Always with the great quotes, While Napoleon. While two French corps under Marshal Lannes began a second bloody siege of Zaragoza, Napoleon saw a chance to get to grips with the British at last. Mm. Intending to trap Moore between his own forces and Soult's second corps, he force-marched his troops over the icy Guadarrama Pass. Yeah, I mean, this is an opportunity to get at the British. He's been trying for a while now, but because they maintain control of the seas and have, you know, a lot of times stayed out of land fighting, he's been struggling to take a stab at British power. So this is an opportunity, a rare opportunity for him to do that. In the midst of a blizzard, Moore, facing odds of more than two to one, immediately ordered a retreat, planning to march 250 miles to the coast, where his army could be evacuated by the Royal Navy. It's probably wise. For both sides, the race to the sea was an exhausting slog through mountains, mud, and bitter cold. Yeah. Many fell by the wayside as British discipline collapsed, leading to looting and drunkenness, except among the rear guard, which fought several skillful delaying actions and kept the French at bay. Nice. Soldiers of Britain's elite 95th Rifles were prominent in these skirmishes. This specialized light infantry regiment wore green uniforms for better concealment and were one of the few units on any side armed with rifles. Mm. Unlike the standard smoothbore musket, rifles had spiral grooves in the barrel that spun the bullet as it was fired, making them slower to load, but much more accurate. Oh yeah. Yeah, this technology would only improve throughout the 1800s. But yeah, the, these guys are armed with the good stuff. So they're going to be far more accurate than, you know, the, the general infantry wielding muskets. In one legendary incident during Moore's retreat at Cacabelos, rifleman Tom Plunkett picked out and shot dead a French general at 400 yards 
Some nice. say further. Thanks to the skill of the rear guard and the desperate pace of the retreat, <laughs> the British kept one step ahead of the French. Mm. On New Year's Eve, Napoleon received grave news from Paris. Rumours of plots and Austria mobilising once more for war. The Emperor immediately left for France, taking many of his best troops with him. Yeah, I mean, imagine if you're part of Moore's army, <laughs> you know, you're running for your life because you know you have to face against Napoleon, you're going to lose. So, you know, it's unsurprising uh, that they sort of got there first in the desperate march to escape because, you know, the, your life is on the line. If you don't escape, you're in very serious trouble. And entrusted Marshal Soult and Second Corps with finishing off the British. The pursuit continued, but on the 11th of January, 1809, Moore's ragged army reached Coruña. For Sir John Moore's exhausted army, the Spanish port meant supplies, rest, and the prospect of rescue. Yeah. But few ships were there to meet them on the 11th. Uh-oh. Fortunately, the British had been able to blow up bridges behind them to delay Marshal Soult's advance. And three days later, on the 14th of January, the naval transports arrived, allowing Moore to begin embarking his cavalry and artillery. But the very next day, Soult's army appeared on the hills south of Coruña, uh -oh. taking up positions on the heights of Peñascuedo, where he sighted his main battery of cannon. Half of Moore's army deployed in a defensive line two miles south of the city, with two divisions held back to protect his right flank. Both armies were roughly 16,000 strong. The French had four regiments of dragoons, while the British cavalry was already aboard ship. But the broken terrain of walls, hedges and olive trees made it a battlefield ill-suited to cavalry. Mm. So in terms of numbers, a fairly even matchup, but the British troops are really struggling at this point. Uh, they've had to make this desperate march back, which the French, French have also made the march, but, you know, discipline is failing among the British. They don't you know, have the supplies they need. They've only just made it back to relative safety. They're trying to evacuate. So, you know, the French are seemingly in perhaps a better position in terms of manpower, though the Brits did get to the city first, so perhaps they had better defensive positioning. So I guess we'll see how this is going to go. Soult's plan was to attack the British right flank and trap Moore's army against the sea. Mm. Around 2 p.m., the French artillery opened fire. Then, Mermet's infantry division advanced, supported by La Housse's dragoons on his left. Moore had been unsure if Soult would attack, and had just ordered Paget's division to begin embarkation. Now, he hurriedly cancelled that uh -oh. order, <laughs> ordering Paget instead to bring up his men to reinforce his open flank and Fraser's division to take up position on the heights of Santa Margarita. The French advanced through hedges and over walls, with heavy firing from skirmishers on both sides. Then the British counterattacked. The 42nd Highlanders and 50th Foot charged into the village of Elvinia and drove the French out. Nice. But in confused fighting, they, in turn, were soon pushed back to their own lines. Mm. Sir John Moore was close to the front line, observing developments, urging on officers and men. But as he ordered up the Guards' Brigade to reinforce the line, he was hit in the shoulder by a cannonball. Oh, wow. He remained conscious, but it was obvious the wound was fatal, and he was Jeez. carried back to the city. Soult sent forward Merle's division to support the attack on Elvinia. Scottish General Sir John Hope had taken over command of the British army from the dying Moor, and he mm. ordered forward two battalions of infantry to meet the French attack. Paget's division, 
led by skirmishers of the 95th Rifles, arrived to shore up the British right flank. The terrain was so bad for horses that French dragoons chose to dismount and fight on foot, but were slowly pushed back by the British. Wow. Paget's advance threatened the flank of Mermet's attack on Elvinia, and he too was forced to withdraw, while an attack on the right by Delaborde's infantry secured a foothold in the village of Piedra Longa, but got bogged down in heavy skirmishing. Mm. Around 6 p.m., dusk fell, and firing died out across the battlefield. News that the British line had held reached Moore shortly before he died in Coruña, around 8 p.m. Man. That night, the British lit campfires and posted sentries, then silently withdrew to Coruña to yeah. begin embarkation. Smart. The next morning, the French found the enemy positions abandoned, but they were slow to take advantage. It wasn't until noon that they were able to bring up six cannon and get them into position overlooking the Bay of Coruña. Jesus. I mean, just imagine this desperate evacuation from the British. It seems to be a common theme for them, desperate evacuations from besieged cities, but, you know, it's just... I mean, yeah, it's, it's just desperate. I mean, you know, you've held the line today, but can you do it again tomorrow? What if the French send reinforcements? You're all on your own. You've got to get out of here. Um, so, yeah. But they, they successfully held the line for one day, which they seems to have been enough to get most people out of there. Uh, I'm not sure if the French are going to catch any men left behind, though. The British had almost completed their evacuation by the time the French guns opened fire. Mm. In a hurried departure, a few British transports ran aground, and two were set on fire. But overall, losses were light. Nice. A small Spanish garrison held Coruña, waiting until the British fleet had escaped to sea, before surrendering. Nice. Wow. Well, did his job. Whether Moore's retreat to Coruña was a British disaster or miraculous escape is still debated. <laughs> and did he abandon Spain in its hour of need or draw off Napoleon's main force, buying time for others? I mean, it can be multiple things at once. I mean, it was a disaster. In the, I mean, it certainly was not good for the Brits, but it was also a miraculous retreat. <laughs> I mean, it could have gone way, way worse. They could have been, I mean, completely destroyed by the French. You know, they were not in a good position, especially when Napoleon was there. So I'd say overall ended in some sort of success that they managed to escape. Um, but, you know... Is definitely a multifaceted situation. <laughs> Either way, Britain's only army had been saved and would yeah. return to fight another day. While Napoleon now faced the prospect of a long war on the Iberian Peninsula mm -hmm. and renewed conflict with Austria, a war on two fronts that would challenge his empire like never before. Oh, yeah. Napoleon had blundered in Spain but it was years before the scale of his mistake was evident. Mm. Then he would say, I embarked pretty badly on this affair, I admit it. The immorality showed too obviously. The injustice was too cynical. The whole of it remains very ugly. Well, there you go, he if said you'd it. Like to learn more about the Peninsular War or any of the campaigns across Europe, all right, so check out their video and, and their sponsor and all that. That was another good one. Um, you know, this is the, the first time we've seen a, a serious mistake or a serious negative event for Napoleon. So far, we've been watching mostly his countless victories, but this would be very bad for him. Um, I mean, as we saw in this video, you know, it already isn't going well, and it would continue to go badly, um, I think. Spain and the the Iberian 
war would be called like Napoleon's Great Ulcer. And I'm not sure who said that, but that's sort of a popular quote that goes around when talking about this because it would bleed for years and years. You know, Napoleon would just have this thorn in his side that would continue to fight him, but he could never, you know, truly defeat it. It wasn't like he was getting momentous defeats every other day in Spain, but they would continue to eat away at his forces. Uh, and there was a lot of guerrilla warfare going on. Um, because a lot of this was sort of, you know, not warfare directed from above, at least on the Spanish side, but sort of local regiments, you know, men getting together to fight for their independence from France. Um, so yeah, it would be a very bad situation for Napoleon. Um, all right. That was a, that was a good one. I really enjoyed that one. Um, you know, really crazy situation, honestly. Uh, I hope you guys had fun with this one too. Uh, please leave a like on the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe to the channel, and please check out the Patreon. Um, yeah, I hope you guys like this one. Uh, I will see you again soon with more reactions, and I uh, hope you guys are having a good day. Goodbye.